Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate you to the next level in your life. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, a major challenge when, when you want to talk about a very sensitive subject, and it's everybody's holy ground here. <laughs> it's called your money, right? And any time you talk about money, I think people get very uncomfortable, especially church people. But here's the reality. When you think about the Bible and you read all the promises of God, which there are over 7,000 promises, over 7,000 promises that God has given through his scriptures, that God has spoken to us. But let me tell you something. One of the things that I think that we probably fail to see is that Jesus taught a lot about generosity. As a matter of fact, he took 36 parables and talked about generosity in the New Testament. 36 parables. He spoke 500 verses on prayer, but he spoke 2,000 verses on giving. And it's, it's, it's mind-boggling because you're just thinking like, wow, why would Jesus talk so much about finances? And the truth is this, is that Jesus hit this very difficult, challenging topic because he knew that if money, if money possesses us, then it becomes our Lord, right? And so there's nothing wrong with money. Money is a tool. Money is a vehicle. But there is something wrong when all of a sudden, instead of you possessing money, it starts possessing you. And, and so for the next few weeks, we're going to talk about generosity. But I don't want you just to get stuck with money either. Because when we talk about God's generosity, we're talking about that we're not only going to be generous in our giving, but we're going to be generous with our talent. We're going to be generous with our, t- with our time. We're going to be generous in our relationships. So it's not necessarily just money. God is a generous God. He's generous with his forgiveness. He's generous with his grace. He's generous with his love. And so this is what we'll be talking about for the next few weeks. We're going to be talking about meet the stewards. And I love this. Because you know what, I, as I was preparing, I got a little bit nervous because I'm just like, oh, God, this is so difficult. When you start talking about money, people get weird. They start talking. They start, you know, feeling uneasy. But I love God because you know what, at the 8 a.m. service, I was in the back during worship. And I was just praying, okay, God, you know, help me to, to deliver to them so that they realize that we're, we're, we're not here to try to give them our opinion. We're, we're here to bring the truth because you said that it's the word that makes us free. And while I was standing back there in the back, this little young boy, seven years old, Jared, and uh, it was his birthday yesterday, and his father approaches me, and he says to me, hey, listen, uh, my son has something to give you. And I'm thinking, okay. I'm like, yeah, well, what's up? And the little boy, he, he busts out a wad of cash, okay, and he says to me, um, he said, here, Pastor, this is for you. And I'm like, what? And so his dad looks at me and says, yeah, um, you know what? He got all kinds of money last night. And this morning he woke up and he felt in his heart that I want to bless my pastor. And, and I'm thinking like seven years old and this kid already understands the principle of generosity. And I love that because not that I, I, I didn't want to take his money, but I'm also not dumb because I know that whatever man sows, he will also reap. Right, And so we can't, we can't begin to teach something and not believe in it and declare. So, of course, we pray together, and, and I was so touched. But I, I can also see where he got that spirit from. His father is a very generous man, very generous. And I love that because you know what? Um, generous is not what you give. Generous is who you are or not, right? And so in the, these next few weeks, I want you to please, um, like, pay close attention because I don't know about you, but I want to continue to see the blessings of God overtake me. You see, I don't have to chase blessings. The blessings begin to chase you down. They look for you. Opportunities will come knocking at your door. You don't have to keep trying to open 10, 15, 20 different doors just to try to receive a blessing. But when you are under the, the will, when you are under the obedience of God's truth, he, he looks for you. He wants to bless you. And I know that last weekend was a great, it's like Dr. Carlos set me up for this, this new series called Meet the Stewards. So I want to start with this verse because I want to lay a foundation for the next few weeks. I want you to look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 21. Matthew chapter 6, verse 21. And, and let me tell you something. I promise you that God wants to bless you. 
he does want to bless you. And, and I hope today's message will, will bless you in the sense of getting a better understanding of what God thinks about generosity. It says, for where your treasure is. Everybody say treasure. treasure. And I love this because he's, he talks about things that we, we care about, things that matter most to us. When, when, he, when he talks about treasure, he's talking about something special to you and me, right? We treasure our talent. How many treasure their talent? Hopefully you do. I treasure my talent that God blessed me with. How many treasure their relationships? Hopefully you treasure your relationships. He says, so where, what you treasure, whatever matters most to you, he says, there your heart will be found also. And so here's, here's a better way to say it. You know what? Your heart follows what you treasure. And so if I treasure relationships, then I invest into them. If I treasure uh, family, then I spend time with my kids. If I treasure whatever your treasure is, there you find your heart also. And so this is a principle that, that God teaches us in the word. Now, I want to be very clear with you because here's the deal. God's more concerned about the change of your heart than he is about the amount of money you give. And I want to be very clear with you. God is not in heaven trying to figure out how he's going to pay the heavenly bills. God's economy does not ever break down, okay? God's not concerned about, you know what, how much the church brings in. God is more concerned about our heart. That's, that's the biggest deal for him because you know what? I can tell you this much. You could, number one, you could never outgive God. You know what? There's no sacrifice that you've given up. And trust me, I understand sacrifice. I have sacrificed careers to be where I'm at today. I have sacrificed a lot of amazing things. But you know what? To God, it's like, no. You know what? There's not enough sacrifice. There's not enough time. There's not enough talent. There's not enough money that you can say that, man, my life has outgiven God. It doesn't, it, it doesn't work that way. How can you outgive the God who owns the universe? Impossible. And so where your treasure is, what you treasure, your heart is right there also. And so as we talk about meet the stewards, as we talk about stewarding our time, stewarding our talent, stewarding our treasure, we have to honestly ask ourselves, is my heart all in or am I half in? Am I somewhat in? Because I want you to know that God wants to bless you. Now, why do we call it Meet the Stewards? Because every single one of you have been called to steward something. Your talent must be stewarded by you. You don't own that, 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 that talent. God gave that talent to you on loan. And, and how many know that God loves it when his kids reproduce? God loves it when his kids multiply. How would you like to multiply in your workplace? How many would love to see, man, every single year I am not only growing in my position, but, man, I'm getting raises, I'm getting bonuses. Man, I can see that there's a greater future for me. I'm telling you, when you put your faith and trust in the God of the universe, God makes a way for you and me. But what happens is I think that we, we get more caught up on the circumstance, right? We get caught up more on the challenges and the troubles, and we start forgetting, wait a minute, I'm a, I'm a child of God, man. I'm, I'm supposed to be living blessed, not struggling all the time. And so a lot of this is an issue with a renewing the mind. Now, if you weren't here on Wednesday, you missed it because it does, it does start with the mind. It majorly starts with your mind. You know what? I've, I've had people say this. Well, you know what, man? I know people that have tithe and they're struggling. Well, let me be honest with you. Let's just be practical for a moment. You know what? You can be a tither and if you're struggling, the only reason that I could probably find for struggling when it's a person that's always tithing and giving but they're struggling is because they mismanage their money. And so we have to become good stewards also in how we manage our finances. That's how we, we provide something called Financial Peace University. But I'm so shocked that within this Financial Peace University that we provide every single year on how to get out of debt, how to stay out of debt, how to save for the future. 
It's amazing how many people come from other churches. Other churches in Santa Clarita are taking advantage of what Elevate Church is providing, but Elevate Church does not jump into it. We think over 2,000 thoughts per day. Did you know that? And 96% of what you think today are thoughts that you thought about yesterday. And only 4% of your thinking capacity today actually gives birth to a brand new thought. So think about this. God wants to renew our mind in this area called generosity. I mean, think about it. If we were to give a simple description or definition, if someone came to you and said, okay, so I want you to define for me, you know what, what how would you express, how would you define this Bible? And you know what, I bet we can come up with a simple phrase, which I did. And you know what it is? God gives. God gives. Think about it. For God so loved the world that he did what? He gave. He saw that there was a lack of what? There was a lack of forgiveness. There was a lack of, of peace. There was a lack of joy. Sin was literally tearing us up, destroying us, messing our families up. And then God cared so much about it that he gave. Think about it. God gave his son. His son gave his life. And then he said, and you were made in the image and likeness of God. And so if I've been made in the image and likeness of God, then that means that I also, as a son of God, then, man, I have the spirit of generosity living inside of me. And when you learn to live with a spirit of generosity, I promise you, I promise you that the blessings, they just overtake you. Man, all of a sudden, you don't have to look for new accounts. You don't have to look for anything because you're living under the, the, the spirit of, of God Almighty, which is the spirit of generosity in all seasons. Because even in dry season, you know what? There should be some, some, some wisdom in making sure that you have enough put away for dry seasons. It's being a Joseph. Learning how to be a Joseph. When things are falling apart, when the economy's crashing, guess what? We are anointed Josephs in the house of God. That we know how to put away so that when it comes, we're ready for anything. And God continues to bless even that. Are you with me today? And so let's lay this foundation today. Now, we, 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 we call this meet the stewards because you're the steward. Grab, shake the person's hand next to you and say, hi, my name is Steward. Yeah. Steward. Yeah. Yeah. We're... we're we're, we're going to have, we're going to have a Israel holy covenant. We're going to change your name from Abram to Abraham, okay? You are now steward, okay? Meet the stewards. We are the stewards. Now, scripturally, it makes total sense. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 2 says this. It says, more over. Everybody say more over. In other words, listen, beyond everything that you have learned, Beyond everything that you understand. Moreover, anything that I'm about to tell you, you better listen to this. He said, it is required. Everybody say required. required. Of stewards that they be found trustworthy. You see, God needs to know that he can trust you with the very thing he's given you. Now, see, right now you either are handling your business or you're mishandling it. And so you can't expect God to give you more when he can't trust you with the little. It doesn't work that way. God wants to trust you with more. But when you have no wisdom, when, when you don't have a, a plan, when, when you don't even know where, where, where your money's going, when there's more month than there is money, you have to come back and say, okay, where, where, where is the problem? Where's the leak? You know what I'm saying? Because here's the reality, if, 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 if you were diagnosed with some kind of disease, the first thing you would ask is, is there a cure for that doctor? Isn't it amazing how we don't care about our health until we need to care about it? We don't care about finances until we're losing everything. We don't care about causes until it hits home. Now I care. And so here's the reality. In the next few weeks, 
you know what? We have to understand that the cure has already been given to us. And his name is Jesus. Wisdom has been imparted into us. And we need to learn not only how to understand it, but how to apply it in our life so that we can go ahead and, and do a diagnosis of whatever uh, issue or condition we have so that we can have a treatment to be better. I was teaching our, our, our men's team on, on Thursday night. We're getting ready for men's ministry. We're going to blow it up uh, this coming month. It's going to be amazing. Not like literally, but you know what I mean. Thank you for that one laugh. Okay, so check this out. This is you now. This is you future. God says, I have plans to what? Prosper you. Plans not to what? harm you, but to give you a hope with a what? Future. Okay, so check this out. I was telling my guys, my team, we were sitting together and I said, listen, this year we all have to desire to see men lift up holy hands. We got a desire to see men engage with God. We got a desire to see men step up and take responsibility. Right? So if God desires it, if God has given us over 7,000 promises then I need to understand something, that with every single promise, there's the premise. With every single promise, there is a condition that comes with the promise. You cannot have a promise of God without a premise. You just, it just doesn't happen. You know what? Until you own something and you're responsible, it's hard to get the full revelation. But with every promise from God, Here's, let, me, let, me, let me do it this way. Okay, so this is, this is me now because I'll just use me, and this is my future. Okay, so I know the promises that God has for Elevate Church. I know them very well. And so right now I'm just like, okay, but how do I get there? Because right now there's a gap between where I am now and where I want to be in the future. There's a gap where you need to get to. There's an in-between. Ever say in-between. Yeah, and it's in the in-between that becomes difficult because you know what? You want to prosper. You want to progress. You want to grow, but you don't know how. How am I going to get there? And so what happens is discouragement settles in, you know, and we have fears that grip us, and we have doubts that try to overcome us daily. But here's the truth. The first thing that we have to do is we have to desire what God desires for us. We have to desire. If God says, I have 7,000 promises for you, when will you desire? Do you even know five of those promises? Do you even know one of his promises other than he wants me healed? What other promises do you know? You see, unless it was tangible, we don't go and seek them out. And so look at this. I'll prove to you that God loves it when his stewards, when his kids love the idea that God has a promise. Psalms 35, 27 says this. It says, let them shout for joy. Can we give God a big shout? One, two, three. That was a weak shout, but we'll take it. Let them shout for joy and be what? Glad. He says, who favor my righteousness cause. And let them say continually. Everybody say continually. In other words, out of my mouth continually, I have to keep speaking the promises of God. Continually. When I'm sick, I got to speak the healing power of God when I'm in doubt I have to speak the truth of God and so he says continually you have to say to yourself let the Lord be magnified who has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant so guess what God wants his kids to be prosperous he gets excited you know why it's not so that you can say like yeah dang I'm good man I got me a little sum sum. You know, I got me a nice car, got me a nice. No, God wants you to be prosperous so that you can help others. God wants you to be blessed so that you can help others. But guess what? If you can't steward the little that he gave you now, if you can't handle what he's giving you now, how can he trust you with more? How? How is that possible? And so what's happening is that I'm seeing this condition in the church, not just elevate Christians in general. There's this condition where, and I get it. Listen, I, I'm a faith preacher too, but I'm also very process-oriented. For me, it's very, okay, what's the plan? 
Okay, I love it, man. You know, lay hands on it, wave whatever, and do all that. I love it. I'm that preacher for you guys. But guess what? But I'm not dumb either. God's downloaded wisdom for me through the scriptures. And so guess what? So the truth is this, is that God desires for us to prosper. So if he desires it, why shouldn't I desire to prosper in everything I do? Whenever I do a project, I don't go in thinking I'm going to fail. I go in thinking, man, I'm going to blow this thing up. You always hear me say that word anyways. <laughs> Women's ministry this Saturday is going to blow up. Men's ministry this week. I want to make sure that I desire everything I do to have awesome success. I want to be successful in everything God gives me. Because if I can succeed in what he gave me, then he says, now I can give him more. I can trust you because you're going to take the little bit I gave you and you're going to do something with it because you understand the principle of multiply. You understand the principle of produce. You understand the principle of, you know what? Sitting down doing nothing is not me. My spirit is a generous spirit. I'm, I have a spirit of always giving life away, right? And so we got to desire that. And so check this out. It's easy to desire, but it's difficult to acquire, isn't it? <laughs> A C U A A C Q U I R E. I know how to spell. It's 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 it's. Listen, easy to desire. Yeah, I want to be blessed, but not so easy to acquire it. Let me tell you why. Because the in between is your gap. Okay. So what do I do with the gap? Well, let me tell you something. The wisdom of God, the Word of God, becomes the bridge to your gap. And you know what the bridge is? The bridge is what is required. So everybody has a desire. Everybody wants to acquire, but nobody wants to do what's required. I want a better job. Okay. So what does that look like? Well, uh, I want to make more money. Okay. Doing what? Uh, I want to get a promotion. Promotion to what? Supervisor. Okay, have you ever supervised before? No, but praise God, I'm believing Jesus. Glory to Jesus. Hallelujah. Okay, well, while you hallelujah, somebody else is going to take that position. Because you know what? The requirement to go to the next level means that you have to meet with someone, talk with someone, read something that, that points to the desire that you want to acquire. If you need to go back to school, you go back to school. If you need to read a lot of books and you read a lot of books, if your business sucks right now, it's not because the devil's taking it from you. It's because you lack the intelligence to say, I have to get a little bit smarter and stop working so hard. It's so quiet up in this Pentecostal church. Thank you. You guys are listening. It's funny, huh? If I say, God wants to bless you, yay! But you got to work for it. Oh, dang. <laughs> <laughs> say it with me. Say, every promise, every promise comes with a premise. With a premise. There's, a There's a condition. There is. There's a condition. How many are ready to grow? Seriously. I want to see, I want to hear about the stories of our people. And it was like Dr. Carlos said last week. How many were here last week? Wasn't that a great message? Yeah. I heard what he said. You know, he said, you know what? Don't be waiting for the millionaires. He's like, they're in this house. But my question is, is when are we going to start desiring to be that person? It says, you know what, I'm going to fund not only projects in this house, I'm going to fund other projects. I'm going to be God's distribution center because God can trust me. Now, what's the problem right now with most people? Here's the problem. Why do we have an issue with money? It's very simple. Let me take you to a verse. Can I take you to another verse? Okay, here's why. Let me tell you why it's an issue. Deuteronomy chapter 8 Verse 17 through 18 says this. Here's our problem. 
you might say to yourself, my power and my strong hands have made me rich. In other words, the problem with most people with, with generosity is because they have this mindset, well, wait a minute, I worked for this, not God. Oh, wait a minute, I worked for this, not the church. This is my gift. This was my power. And so here's the truth. <laughs> Verse 18, but remember, everybody say, but remember. but remember. So the person that says, I did it, God says, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. He says, but remember the Lord your God. He gives you the what? He gives you the time. He gives you the talent. And he gives you the treasure. He said, I gave you that ability. What are you talking about? Do you know that by God's grace, we get to work every day? Think about it. Until your health goes down, we don't care. But God's saying, but I care for you. He says, my power, my strong hands have made me rich, but remember the Lord your God. He gives you the ability to what? Produce what? Wealth. That shows he stands by the terms. Tell me, turn on the AC in here. Is it me or is it warm up in this place? He says that shows he stands by the terms of the what? Covenant. So, so check this out. God's saying, hey, I, I, I want to give you the power to gain wealth, but there is a covenant and there are some conditions that you and I need to come in agreement to. Okay, because I promise you, listen, and, and this isn't a message to try to stir you up to give here. Let me tell you something. For seven years, God has met the need of Elevate Church with you and without you. You know what I'm saying? So this isn't about, you know what, all right, let's see if we can get everybody to really get on, on board with this. Now, obviously, wouldn't that be wonderful? I'm, I'm telling you, the church would have more influence in the world if the people truly invested in the treasure called the church, the house of God. There would be more change in our cities. There would be more transformation. The only thing that every single church lacks is finances to get things done. It's not, I'll tell you this, it's not vision that we like. It's not passion that we like. It's not excitement that we lack. Because I'll tell you, we're a very passionate church. What we lack, like every church lacks, it's getting the people to invest and treasure the house of God to get the vision completed for this city and whatever city God gives us. That's it. That's it. That's it. But guess what? You and I have the power to either produce wealth or we have the power to stay poverty-minded. You might as well use the energy to get power to renew my mind so that I can start giving birth to new thoughts and to make a change. I had a business owner come to me after the service, after the aid. They said, hey, because I had told this person, you need help, man. You need help. And didn't listen, didn't listen. But now he said, I'm ready for that help. Why? Because you know what? At some point you have to tell yourself, okay, maybe I'm in this condition because I brought myself to this place. I did this. Are you with me today? Okay, so he says, he says, but remember the Lord your God. He gives you the ability to produce wealth that shows, stands by the terms of the covenant he made with you. And look at this. I love this. He what? Promised. He promised it to your people a long ago, and he's still faithful to his covenant. Aren't you glad that God never changes his mind? Like he is just so generous. Even when you forget to be generous, even when you forget to help, even when you forget that the talent, that the gifts he's placed in you, the treasures that he's given you have all come from him, and when you've forgotten, he still says, but I'll remain faithful to you. I love, isn't he a loving God? He is so generous. If I were to give a definition of generous, you know what I would say? I would say that the definition to generous is love in action. Right? Because you can't say I love you and not be generous. There's no such thing. If I say I'm generous towards you, then I'm going to show it in action, right? If I'm going to say I love you, you're going to experience my love in action. But you can't say I'm generous and there's no action behind it. It doesn't make sense. There must be an action to, 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 to who I am, 
right? And so we have to understand that, that God is a generous God. He is a loving God, and he went to action. When we were bound in our sin, he said he gave us his son, Jesus. He went, he went to work. He went to action. He said, there's no way I'm going to lose my kids. I love them too much. In the midst of their mess, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make some amazing messages out of their story. Man, I know that, that God loves every single one of us in whatever condition we are now, but it's time for change. It's time. Are you guys ready? All right. So let me give you the perfect example of love in action. Do you guys remember the story of the prodigal son? So check this out. So Jesus is telling the story to, to his disciples. And as I started reading this, I thought, wow, you know what? I love the word of God because God is always trying to give us a bridge to our, our, our promise. You know, it's like he's like telling us, like, this is what you have to do. This is what needs to happen. And we all say yes and amen. And then we go back. See, right now, you're either creating a life by design or by default. You're either creating a life by design or you're defaulting back every single week to who you really are. We got to change the way we think. We got to renew our mind. Please. What I'm bringing you today, and let me tell you something, this subject is very touchy because you're talking about finances, but you know what? God forbid that I would withhold information from you when you need to prosper because it is his pleasure that you prosper. It is his pleasure. God desires that you prosper. God desires that you prosper not only financially, but that you prosper relationally, that you would prosper in your gift, that you would prosper in your career, that you would prosper in everything you do. But we have to come back to Almighty God and say, God, without you, I'll never prosper. I need you. I need to bring you back in the picture. I need to put God first again. And when I put God first, now he's the centerpiece of my life. And now we can do some things together with him, right? And so everybody say love in action. And so Jesus tells this story of generosity. We know the story of the prodigal son. You know what? The, the name prodigal, if you, if you study it out, it means wasteful. So let's just call it the wasteful son. Have you ever wasted time? Have you ever wasted life? Have you ever wasted your money on something stupid that you regretted? Have you ever wasted time with the wrong relationships? And so this prodigal son, this wasteful son, he comes to the father. And Jesus tells this story because he wants to paint a picture of your heavenly father. And the, the son comes to his heavenly father. So let's just think this way. Heavenly father, he says, okay, heavenly father, you know what? You promised me an inheritance. Okay, and I have believed that you have all the finances that I need. But guess what? I want you to give it to me now. I have been here. I have served you. I have loved you. I have did everything you told me to do, but I am through. Now give me my inheritance. And Jesus is telling the story. And the father was like, but no, son, I promise you, if you just wait a little bit longer, you're going to get greater increase. You're going to be blessed beyond measure. I'm telling you, son, there's just so much more. There's some maturity that I'm doing in you because you know what? I know that the favor of God is upon you. You cannot... You cannot exit early. You cannot do that, son. And he said, no, give me what's mine. You see, in those times, to, to, to retrieve your inheritance is to basically, it was the most cruel, most evil statement that one can make. Because in, in, in the Jewish tradition, the only time that you received your full inheritance is when your father died. So basically, he was telling his father, why don't you just die already and give me what's mine? Selfish, ignorant, egotistic. But how many of us have been wasteful too? And you know what his father said? He said, okay, son. And he gives us his inheritance and he says, here, I just wish you would have done this right. Isn't it amazing how God will let us have our way? Because he'll never control you. He'll never make you choose him. He'll only love you to him. He won't make you do anything you don't want. And so we know what does the son go do? He goes and he takes the money and what does he do? He parties. He's boozing it up. 
He's hanging out with prostitutes, right? He's bumping every day, boom, 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 until, man, he gets, listen, he gets used, abused. He gets ripped off. He gets beat down. And now he's in the pig pen. Now he's in the mud. Isn't it, doesn't it suck that sometimes we have to hit the mud in order to come back to our senses? And he did. The Bible says he came back to his senses. And he said, if only I go back to my father, I know that he has many servants. I know that I can never retrieve my position of son, but at least I can have a, a, a roof over my head and I can be a servant for him and he'll, he'll provide a bed. He'll, at least I'll have something to eat every day. And he comes back to his father after he was wasteful. And look what Luke chapter 15 says right there. He says, so he got up and he went to his father. And while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him. And he was filled with what? His daddy was filled with tender love. You would think that the daddy would be like, you idiot, I done told you. You, man, I'd be walking out with my chancla and my belt and be like, about to give him the whoop down of his life, right? But no, thank God I'm not the heavenly father, huh? Thank God you're not the heavenly father, right? But we have a heavenly father who in the midst of your junk... He still has tender love for you because he wants the best for you. And it says, and while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and he was filled with tender love for his son. And so he ran to him. Listen, the blessings will come chasing you. The son didn't chase the father. Why? Because he felt like I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy. When you're not living under the house of the father, you don't feel worthy. When you don't understand the love of the Father, you don't feel worthy. When you don't understand the love of the Father, you don't see that God wants prosperity and blessings for you. You begin to get formed and shaped by the rules of this world. And so look, and so he ran to him and he threw his arms around his son and he kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you. I am no longer fit to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattest calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. This son of mine was dead, and now he's alive again. He was lost, and now he's found. So they began to celebrate, and it was amazing. Check this out. Jesus is displaying to you and I what a true generous father looks like. He says in the midst of his sin, in the midst of a son being wasteful with his time, being wasteful with his talent, being wasteful with his money, the father still believed in him and said, son, you see, here's the truth. The son realized that the only pathway to righteousness and healing and restoration is to go back to the house that never lacked famine. When he lacked, he knew where to go back. How do I know that? Well, look how descriptive it is. The father hugged him, kissed him, and he looks at his servant and says, quick. Everybody say quick. See, when you, when you get your attitude back in line with God, when you change your heart back in God, he moves quick. He says, quick, bring me, bring, me, bring me the best robe. Why do you use the word best? Because our God is, gives us the best. He doesn't give us leftover. He gives us the best. Bring me the best robe. Brings the best. Big old fluffy, hairy thing, just like Bam. You know, what is he doing to him? He's giving him back his identity. And then he says, bring me the bling ring. For all you ladies that like the bling bling. And he comes and he brings him the bling ring. And then he's like, whoa, priesthood. He says, son, you're part of my family. And in in my household, we serve God. We love God hard. And then he says what? Bring me the fattest. He could have said, hey, just bring the, bring the vaca, you know, bring the cow over here. Hey, bring the, you know, bring the goat. No, he says, bring me the fattest. He could have said, bring me the skinny one. What does that show? Look, he says the best, the bling, and the fattest calf. Because we're about to throw the biggest party in 2017. 
and we're gonna rejoice that my sons and daughters are back in my house and they're living under my roof, under my blessings, under my breakthrough, under my victory and they're no longer gonna be thinking like, like, like these, these impoverished, low-level thinking people. Come on, the, the, the kingdom of heaven has streets of gold, walls of jasper. We don't have a busted, broke God. He is a, he's, a, he's a rich God. He's a, a blessed God, and he loves his kids. And if you can't get that revelation, then you know what? Then keep living what you're living. Because at the end of the day, he says it's his pleasure. If it's not yours, then do it for his pleasure. Oh, no, pastor, not me. I'm good with what I have. Okay, well, then do it for him because he'll take the pleasure that you're not willing to have. Are you, are you here? Yes. Last verse. Give me the latter part of Luke, please. Look at this because there's two types of children in the house, guys. There's the crazy one. <laughs> And then there's the one so-called, I do it all for you, God. And the older son, his brother, was in the field. And when he was coming near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So what kind of party do you think this was? If you can hear music and dancing, ooh, it was like, you know, you know I mean, you, you can hear it. You're, he's, they're hearing the music, and he's hearing the dancing like, and he's like, what the? I, what? And he's getting closer. Next verse, please. And he, he asked them, the servant, hey, man, what's going on, dude? What, what, what? Why is there dancing and see What's going on? What, why is there a party going on? Come on, guys, move it. So your brother has come home. And the servant replied, your father has killed the fattest calf. And he has done this because your brother is back safe and what? Sound. Look at this. Keep going. And the older brother, man, became ticked off. Come on. You know that Christian that gets mad because someone else is blessed? Or that Christian that says, you know what? I'm living for God, and those people at my work are living for hell, and they're always blessed, and they always have their bills paid, and they're always good. What is wrong with you? What we're saying is that it's better to live in the world than to be under the house of the Father. And he got all angry up in the church. He refused to go in. I ain't going in. Forget that. No, I'm, I'm not going back to that church. I ain't, forget that. I don't like that message anyways. <laughs> Talking about this generous. Yeah, but you want forgiveness, huh? But you want grace. But you want love. But with every promise, there's a premise. And so the father went out and looked. He even went out to his son and said, come on, son, please, just come back in. You know, stop acting cray-cray, man. What's wrong with you? He was cray-cray. You were supposed to be the one that was there for me, man. Look what he says to him. But he answered and he said, father, look, man, all these years I've worked like a slave for you. See, you can be in this house, in the father's house, and you can think you're a slave because you obey and forget that you're a son and you're a daughter of the Most High God. Who said you were a slave? Who said that? Sometimes we're under the slave of our poverty instead of being son of his righteousness. And look, and he said, all these years I worked for you, I have always obeyed your orders. You have never gave me even a young goat. And so I celebrate with my friends. You know, you gave him a fat cat. You, I didn't even get a small little goat. I didn't even get a pony ride in my birthday. You give me a... But how many of us start whining and, hey, how, come, how come their family's better? How come their business is blowing up? How come their... And we get this whiny slave mindset like, Poor is me, woe is me. No, there is no poor is me with God. No, no, there is no famine in his house. There's only provision in his house. There's only generosity in his house. But this son of yours, he wasted your money. 
with some prostitute. Now he comes home, and for him, you kill the fattest calf? He can't get over the fat calf. It's probably his pet, too. My son, the father said, you are always what? And everything I have is what? So why are you acting crazy, man? Everything. In other words, you know what? If you only knew, son, that your inheritance was so much greater than your brother's. But you're so jealous that you can't even see that what I have for you is more. Amen. Say to me, say, Lord, I'm your son or daughters. You see, we have to desire his promise. But we have to do what's required. And you know what's required? You go back home. And you get back under his word. And we get back to his conditions. And then we're going to see the, 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 the greatest breakthrough in our finances and our relationships and everything. But we got to go back to him. Don't hate on others when they're blessed. Because the Lord says to you today, daughter, son, you're always with me. Everything I have is yours. God's timing is perfect. Bow your head, close your eyes. Father, as we leave today, we thank you for just your grace, your joy, your strength. I pray, Father, if there's anyone here today and you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, this is the day that you have made. And I just thank you, Father, that you would do something amazing right now in the lives of people. If you're here today and you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, Listen, for God so loved you that he gave his son Jesus to forgive you. We've all messed up. We've all missed it. But there's a God in heaven who loves you. And the only condition he has today for you and me, or especially for those who are far away from God, you know what the condition is? He says, believe me with your heart and confess me with your mouth and you shall be saved. Come on, today's your day if you're here and you, you know that you need to have this intimate relationship with God. This is your hour right now. You can't wait another day. You can't wait another minute. You got to respond to God because he wants to pursue you and hug you and kiss you and love you. And so today's your day. If you've been far away from God and you know you've been far away and you feel like the prodigal son or daughter or if you're someone who has never invited Christ into your life, he wants to have a relationship with you, not religion. When I count to three, you're going to lift your hand up in the air. We're going to pray together and it's going to be an amazing, awesome day for you and for heaven and for us here on earth. Are you ready? If you want to invite Jesus Christ into your life, if you want to surrender your life to him, if you're saying, God, help me, I need you, I'm that son, I'm that daughter, I need your help, today's your day. When I count to three, hands are going to go up, and then you know what? As you put your hand up high in the air so I can see it, you're responding to God, but you're also allowing me to see so I can pray for us today. When I count to three, your hand will go up, and you can put it right back down. But leave it up for just like two seconds so I can see. Ready, this is your hour, this is your day. One, you're ready to give your life to Jesus too. You know that he loves you after hearing something like this. How can you refuse a loving father? Three, if that's you, lift your hand high. Lift it high. I see all those hands. Lift it high. Lift it high. Lift it high. Good. I see all those hands. Good. I see all those hands. Lift it high. So I see. I see all those hands. Awesome. You can put them down now. I see that. Let's all pray this together. Say, Jesus, come into my heart and be my Lord and my Savior. Forgive me of all my sins, every one of them. Today, it's a new day. I'm receiving a new life in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for not giving up on me and for pursuing me with your blessings. I'm born again, filled with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Awesome. Can we give the Lord a big hand clap and just say thank you, God, for being so generous? There is like six or seven of you that lifted your hands. Let me tell you something. At the end of the service, our prayer team will be up here to help you with the what's next. In addition, if you're here today and you need prayer for anything, we're here for you. I am going to challenge you now with something. Listen. I know that not many of you tithe. And when I say many, I mean many. But here's the challenge. You're going you're gonna to test God. You're going to trust God. 
And you're going to bring your tithe to him. Here's why. Because there's a requirement to what you want to acquire with him. Every promise comes with a premise. And here's the challenge. Try him. Test him. I've been tithing for 20 years. You know what? The first day I got saved, I started tithing that same, that same week. I've never stopped for 20 years. And I've seen the hand of God. You know what? When I first got to my church, I was, I'm, un, I'm uneducated, guys. I've, I've been to seven high schools, never college. But you know what? I'm very much self-taught. I, I'm hungry to learn. I'm hungry to, to grow. I'm hungry to change. And so I apply myself a lot. To this day, I apply. I, you know what? I can, I can gladly say that, man, I, I've studied the word, you know, it's so much that, that I just keep seeing the growth even in my own personal life but because I apply myself. I'm telling you, when you apply God's word, amazing things happen. Amazing things happen. If you've never tithed, start. God, God has a financial plan. He says, bring all the tithe into the storehouse. Once again, it's not about your money. It's about your heart. Because what you treasure, there your heart will be also. Do you treasure the house of God? If you treasure the house of God, then you bring the tithe. The tithe is not for you to split it up and take it to this place. That No. No, that's the offering. The offering, you do whatever you want with it. But the, the tithe is you're saying, God, every time I receive my check, the first thing I'm going to do because you're, I put you first, God, I'm going to bring my tithe. And you're going to bless it. And I'm going to honor you. And I'm not going to think like a slave anymore. I'm going to think like a son and a daughter. God's not trying to take something from you. He's trying to add something to you. That's why the cross is a plus. It's a plus, not a minus. It's a plus. And so... Test them. Try it. Try it for 90 days. If it doesn't work, then stop tithing. And stop. And trust him. Because he wants to trust you. But if you can't trust him with the little you have right now, he'll never trust you with the more he wants to give you. He won't. And scripturally, that's it. Amen. If today's message impacted you in any way and you would like to help us spread the gospel to others by giving a financial gift, please text the number below and we know that someone's life will be changed as yours was today.